Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, you're about to hear a very good analysis by uh, a gentleman by the name of Clive, uh, who is, uh, you know, who has his expertise in understanding the economy of the world. And so you're going to hear his take on what is happening in the economy of the world. And so um, having said that, inshallah, after this talk, I want to see if it is beneficial, and all of you can tell me if it's beneficial or not. But I want to see if it is beneficial to include something a little bit spiritual at the end of all of these talks that we do and so on and so forth. Okay? So, but before we begin, I want to share something with you. Okay? So, you have over here a picture that I want you to concentrate about and I want you to think about. It says they were together in one car. They were together in one car for, I don't know how long, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then they came out of the car, and even though they were in the car together, laughing, talking, smiling, you know, whatever. And now they got out of the car, and now they have separated six feet. This is the result of the programming. That is, think about how this type of programming, the TV, the media, the, the government's instructions, all of these these things, how much they affect us. That no one would think, wait, we don't need to do this necessarily right now because we're a family and we've been driving together. And so, uh, you know, they come out of the car and it's already like a robot. This is the power of waswasa or this is the power of subliminal messages that you begin to act like a robot. You begin to act like a robot. And you react to things like a robot. And you respond to things like a robot. And this is what you have to be careful of because this is like, they are like an'am, they are like the cattle. But even worse, not that these brothers, no, astaghfirullah, I'm not, I'm talking about all of us, right? We all have this problem that what is being fed to us uh, in it, what is being fed to us through the media, through the news, through the different outlets, uh, we are accepting it without filtering it. And then when we have to do something, we do it according to the way we were told. You see, if I'm talking to you, I'm going to filter out what's right, what's wrong, do I accept this, don't I accept this, right? But when you're watching the news, it's like you're in... You're, in, you're hypnotized. You're in what we call a trance. You're just accepting it. And even though if you don't even necessarily like it, you just kind of like go along with it because it's already inside you. Anyway, so on to uh, the uh, discussion with uh, Mr. Clyde, okay? Or Clive. So inshallah, let's listen to Mr. Clive. Uh, but um, anyway, that's another matter. So over to you, uh, Clive. <clears throat> Many thanks, Murray. Good afternoon and good evening, or even good morning to some people. Um, many thanks to all three of you so far, and to Matt, obviously, for organising this. Um, I've learned a great deal already, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what the other speakers have to say. Um, before I start, I'll just give you a brief introduction to my journey of discovery, because that is basically what's informed what I'm going to uh, present in my short talk. Um, as Maine said, we met at Occupy, which was a reaction to the global financial crisis of 2008, where clearly there was no adequate reaction from authority, but there was outrage from the 99%. And out of that was born a, a research and, and learning project called Critical Thinking. And um, Omar talked about abstraction or atomization, taking small pieces of a, of a piece of the political economy and dissecting it and making assumptions, usually erroneous assumptions. And we have no context. Uh, and we're very much in tune with what Omar had to say, that you need a holistic view of the world. And out of that came our methodology, which is a self-organizing co-creative learning development. And we've actually outsourced our methodology at a website, co-creativelearning.org. Um, 
and out of that, I've personally, having worked in the city for 30 odd years, many of those years, I didn't really understand the money system, um, which doesn't, if you don't understand the money system, then you don't understand economics, basically. Uh, but learning through collaborative learning and the co-creative learning process has led me to try and start these conversations in financial circles where there is a growing demand to know, for interpretation for what's going on. And we believe that the only way to, co to arrive at that understanding is the, the puzzle is too big and complex for any one individual. But if we work together, filtering and synthesizing and sharing information, then we'll get a much clearer picture of what's going on. And my contention is that once we understand what's going on, we'll know what to do. And I'll talk more about that in my, in my talk. Um, but as Omar pointed out, this is, this is a satanic system uh, involving satanic magic. And my view of the difference between Satanism, and if you like, spirituality, is that spirituality is awareness that you're part of the great unconscious universe, or conscious universe, should I say. You are, you are an, an individual instance of universal consciousness, whereas Satanism is want to be ignorant of that fact and be very selfish. So, so to me, this idea of jealousy and selfishness very much accords with what Omar was saying. And coming on to uh, Simon's talk, I thought that his, his description of this fusion of state power and uh, capitalism was characterized by Mussolini as fascism. That is classic fascism, when, when you have a, a single authority. I would say it's much worse than that. I would say this is not state authority and corporate authority. This is all authority coming under one world government under the control of money power, but more of that in a minute. And I think um, Simon also referred to the neoliberal doc doc doctrine under structural adjustment as administered by the IMF and the, um, the World Bank. Um, but Naomi Klein, I think, described structural adjustment most clearly as the shock doctrine which was introduced by the Chicago School of Business uh, initially into Latin America at the barrel of a gun under Augusto Pinochet. Um, and it's been rolled out in the developing world ever since. And now it has come home to the developed world and Western Europe and the USA are now falling victim to the shock doctrine. So what I'm going to talk about is essentially that we have been in at a state of war for the last 20 years. And the, the beneficiaries of that war are the beneficiaries of almost everything that is going on. And I'm going to describe the various phases in that war. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about how and why money power actually is the conduit through which all of these manifestations that hurt us all how, it, how it's actually controlled by money power. And essentially, uh, a couple of papers that we've recently published talk about plunder in the political economy. The whole political economy is based on plunder rather than wealth creation. And very much in tune with Moeen's global research, I'm going to explain a bit about the dynamics of that and the role that fiat money plays in that. And then talk about an alternative, because our contention is that if money power is centralized and that is controlling all the levers of power, then if we decentralize money, and we're going to argue that this is already happening, then we're well on our way to decentralizing all of the conduits of power. Uh, but more of that as we go through. So first of all, to put the current situation in context, COVID-19 is what we regard as phase four in World War III, or war on us all. And the opening phase occurred in September 2001, and that opened the door for blanket surveillance, the technocratic society, 
And the war on terror was nothing other than the war on us all, because those instigating the war on terror were those who were actually saying that they were trying to stop it. They were feeding both sides of the conflict. And you can, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that as you go through Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, um, there is always these, these manipulated opposing forces. And we're beginning to see that unfold in the West. That was followed by the climate change narrative, which really took off, where people started to blame each other and themselves for their lifestyles, all on the basis of what I would call fraudulent science. Um, if you've studied climate science, then you will know that we are heading into a solar minimum, a grand solar minimum, which could well lead to another little ice age. Um, so the biggest risk is cooling, not not warming, but I'm not here to talk about global warming. The next phase occurred in the autumn of 2015 when all immigration controls were dropped in Western Europe and there was a huge migration of immigrants who were being used as weapons. These were victims of the plunder of their own political economies in their own domestic countries. They were also victims of the wars that had been fought um, but they are being used as weapons in order to create the division within Europe and the US in order to get people focusing each other on each other rather as being the problem rather than focusing on the structure of the system under which we live, which is the real author of all our misery. Whether you're an immigrant or indigenous, the problem is the structure. It's not the people, it's not the color of their skin, it's not their religious belief, it is the structure of incentives and penalties under which we live. Um, so in my last presentation I gave at uh, one of Moeen's talks, Global Vision 2000 in December, um, I talked about all roads lead to Jerusalem because that is where money power is building its world government. And there's a short video on BitChute uh, on the outersite.org BitChute channel which is called All Roads Lead to Jerusalem. Um, and I'm not going to go any more into that, but if you want to follow that thread, I would suggest that you read that, uh, you watch that video. Um, but I, I'm putting COVID into context, and I'm just going to put a URL into the chat. This is an article written on Friday, which attempts to contextualize what I've just described as COVID-19 being phase four in this war on us all. And phase four is very much based on fear. Phase what all, all three are based, all four, three phases beforehand have been based on fear, certainly the war on terror, but the COVID narrative or manufactured pandemic is, is so powerful because people are in mortal fear of their life because they've lost their connection with their spirituality and they don't understand that they are not at threat from this so-called, not serious threat, from this so-called deadly virus. We know that the Rockefeller Foundation referred to a pandemic in its 2010 document. The event was rehearsed on, it on October 2019 by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, World Economic Forum and the Gates Foundation uh, and John Hopkins University. Uh, and that is basically what we're, what was being prepared for that we're currently uh, undergoing. And further evidence that this was planned well in advance is there's a lady called Celeste Solem who has explored the Wealth Economic Forum's strategic intelligence website which actually goes down 200 layers across the global economy as to what the, what the policy response and what they're going to do in response to COVID-19. If this was really a spontaneous reaction to a sudden emergence of a pandemic, they wouldn't have anything of such sophistication and power. Our analysis at Critical Thinking came up with three fundamental flaws in the political economy. Institutional hierarchy, theft of the commons and usury and other speakers have referred to the usury based economy and basically money power is derived from its ability to create money from nothing and it can do that because of usury it wouldn't be able to do that without usury and as i said 
the political economy as a result of these three flaws, particularly hierarchy and theft of the commons, they are synonymous. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have hierarchy without the ability to steal wealth from others in order to reward those who support you. And similarly, you wouldn't have theft of the commons if there wasn't a reason to go and plunder other people in order to pay tribute to some higher authority in the institutional hierarchy. So they are synonymous, but they are exacerbated by this mechanical wealth transfer mechanism, which is usury or interest on money. But this, this political economy based on plunder isn't just based on wars or wars for conquest for territory or um, resources or even people. It's actually embedded within the economy itself and it manifests itself in so many ways, in massive inequality, massive poverty, uh, poverty uh, reduced life expectancy, reduced well-being, reduced healthcare. There are many references as to how this is created and that that is, uh, if you like, contained within another paper that we've produced, which I'm also going to put into the chat, which is um, called The End of the Age of Plunder, um, which basically, um, have I put it in twice? I might, might have put it in twice. Hopefully you can, the link will work. Um, and essentially, the age of plunder is, looks as though, it might be coming to an end. And Moeen and others have talked to this, talked about this global reset. And obviously what money power has in mind is to reset the economy with the digital economy that everybody is tied to, probably conditional on being uh, vaccinated, being tracked, and many other conditions, social distancing, etc. And then you will be given some sort of dispensation in the form of universal basic income but at the same time, they're crashing the economy. So any wealth that is accumulated is going to absorb into the, the criminal banking system's hands, as it has every time, as it did in 1929 and as it did in 2008. Uh, and we're, this global reset, reset is occurring within unprecedented circumstances where we have massive inflation of the money supply through central bank issuing confetti money effectively, combined with governments basically collapsing economies through this so-called reaction to uh, a pandemic, which is clearly no worse than a threat than a typical flu and arguably much less toxic or dangerous to health than the vaccinations they're trying to foist on everybody. So when we talk about money power, we have to think about what is money and what is any money. Now, fiat money is issued by the, the ostensibly by the government, but it's not. It's issued by a private banking system under the authority of the government ostensibly, but basically the power dynamic is the other way around. Money power controls governments because it controls the media, it controls academia, it controls the politicians, it controls the corporations. And so their fiat money system only has value because we believe in it. And the way they're trying to destroy it is reminiscent of what happened in 1720 in France when John Law, a Scotsman, had to flee France having crashed the, the currency of the, of the country. Similarly, the Weimar Republic in the early 20th century overissued its currency and collapsed the economy. And this is the trick that is being conducted worldwide by most of the central banks, certainly those that are under the control of the privately controlled Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland. Um, the first phase of the war, and I want to say a little about geopolitics, created this this environment for perpetual war. As long as we are at war, it feeds the military and justical industrial complex. It feeds the, the, um, the, the machine of fear, because fear is, a, and it feeds many other benefits. So it's a war that, perpetual war is a gift that keeps on giving. And so when we talk about power centers of Russia, China, 
and if you like the Western Bloc, they are all accountable to money power. They're all being manipulated, many of them unconsciously, by money power. They've been funded by money power. The Bolshevik revolution was funded by money power. China's rise and technology was provided by the West. And these are chess pieces that are played in order to distract us and keep us fearful and feed the military industrial machine. But money power, having been central for so long, or we've become used to it, um, I think it was Omar talked about the return of gold as being the, if you like, divine currency in some way, or a currency that has divine endorsement or backing. But I would argue that all of these currencies, no matter what they are, are pixie dust. And pixie dust is essentially, it only works if you have faith and trust. And in the same way, money only works if you have faith and trust. So when people lose faith in the dollar, the pound, the euro, the yen, whatever currency we're talking about, because they've overissued it and they flee into gold, cryptocurrencies, alternative currencies, that will be at the point at which they have lost the power of pixie dust. And therefore, if we're talking about how we get out of this mess, we've talked about, uh, I think Simon mentioned that credit will be scarce. And this is the power of the short side. At the moment, the global cartel banks and the central banks have the monopoly of money and they control the short side. Everybody wants money, but only they can dispense it and they dispense it as we've amply seen over the last 10 years. They dispense it to their friends and their cronies and the people that they favor. Um, but that, and pixie dust is also going to be provided to the people in the form of u universal basic income. This is the carrot with the digital currency and the mark of the beast or the microchip to prove that you've been vaccinated. And once you've got that, then you can get your universal basic income. That's just another form of pixie dust. And if you take, if you take it and believe in it, then it has value. But our, our contention is that we can break this cycle of monopoly power and centralized money by decentralizing currency. And the last two papers that we produced and what the age, end of the age of plunder refer, refers to is that there is, is already a dynamic away, underfoot that is actually creating alternative currencies beyond gold, beyond silver, beyond local exchange traded schemes, beyond local currencies. Um, the, the decentralized finance environment is beginning to not only emerge, but to thrive. And it was kicked off arguably by the introduction of the Unlawful Internet Gambling Act, Enforcement Act of 2006 in the US, which didn't actually outlaw gambling, but it made the acceptance of funds for gambling, online gambling purposes illegal. And the gambling companies also were working in an environment where the internet was beginning to give birth to all sorts of new ideas, one of which was virtual worlds, virtual currencies, and you had this fusing together or coming together of a need of the gambling industry to find a way of transferring money at low cost without high credit card charges and all the rest of it, and some circumventing legislation, and had, had the virtual world um, who offered the solution in the form of currency wallets and tokenization. And this paper, The End of the Age on Pl of Plunder, is putting forward not only the, these foundations that already exist in which to create this decentralized money, which basically means that rather than having to rely on universal basic income, which you will get only on satisfying certain conditions, that this is pixie dust for all that can be used for all reasons and all seasons. And a lot of the, the if you like, ideas for decentralized finance come from the development of the internet and the free software movement itself. Because most of the internet, even Microsoft's web services, Apple's web services, most of the routers, all of the infrastructure is 
is dependent on free software. That's where Windows originated. It's where Apple Mac originated. Everything is created from this free software movement. And basically we move, if, if we move to a decentralized currency, we, uh, we move from a, a system that is driven by exchange value, which is determined by the short side. In other words, it's the providers of capital and money um, who dictate the terms of our acceptance. Or if we have decentralized finance, then we move to use value. Um, we produced a short video, which is referenced in the paper called Rubber Dub Dub, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, tokenization in seven days. And in that we explain a mechanism that actually tries to recreate the social glue that used to exist before hierarchical system uh, civilizations emerged, where there was a feeling within societies and tribes and groups of mutuality, where there wasn't an actual physical di accurate accounting of every favor or every gift, but there was a constant process of reciprocation because there was an, a necessary understanding for survival that was based on co-creative co -creative development, collaboration, sharing. In other words, reciprocation. So you do me a favor, I do you a pay, favor. Your house suffers the roof collapsing. We all come around and help. And one day when one of us is in need, everybody else comes to help us. And this is the fundamental concept that underpins this idea of decentralized money and tokenization. And it expresses itself in two primary ways. One is in what we would describe as project tokens. And this provides, at the moment, if you want to get money to start a project, whatever it may be, you have to go cap in hand to the bankers or to somebody else. The idea of project tokens was pioneered in, in 1820 in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, when Guernsey, an, island, uh, an English protectorate off the south coast, um, had no economy. Basically, they were destitute. Their sea walls were crumbling, their infrastructure was inadequate, it was, it was failing, and they had no market, no commerce. So they went along to the, the UK representatives and explained their problem. He said, um, well, what's your problem? They said, well, we have no money. And he said, well, do you have men and uh, labor? And they said, yes. And do you have materials? And they said, yes. And they said, he said, well, what, what, what's the problem? And they said, we have no money. So he suggested they create their own. And that's what they did. They created enough money to start buying the materials, paying the people to repair the seawalls, repair the, the infrastructure and build the market. In two years, they built a market. In 10 years, they had a thriving economy and the bankers came back and put a stop to issue of any more Guernsey pounds. There are still Guernsey pounds in existence, but they weren't allowed to continue the practice. They rely on fiat money like most other people. So that's one form of token. The other form of token really comes down to a fairly novel concept, which is explained in that video I described earlier, um, which is the idea of if you need money, for a given purpose, you create a credit token. So in the case of the film, it describes the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker issuing credit tokens to each other. And according to the number of credit tokens that they owe each other, it creates a monetary environment in which an exchange, value, uh, uh, an exchange rate is established, which is not based on uh, supply and demand, but based on use value. So unlike fiat currency or prices determined in competitive markets, it's, it's a mechanical process to create a use value. In other words, what use is it to the individual? A bit like the free software movement. If a piece of software or application is of no use to anyone, then nobody supports it. But if it's popular and useful, then it thrives. Similarly, if a currency is useful and people value it, then it will be used and will thrive. If people over, over issue their currency, they will debase it and then it has no value. So it is reg self-regulating. So in essence, what, what is described in, in that paper is really a possibility for a transformation. And when we talk about spiritual transformation, 
my understanding, I'm a very spiritual person, or I like to think I am, because I believe that I'm part of this universal consciousness, but I do not adhere to any particular, if you like, theological doctrine, because I, I think they're all founded in exactly the same concept. And it is this idea that we, part, we are part of a universal consciousness, and what the process of decentralizing money through tokenization will do is give unconditional pixie dust for everyone to enable us to live a more spiritual existence because the world is far too complex and far too far too full of conflicting beneficiaries victims in any given situation there is no perfect world there are good things that happen there are bad things that happen and in order to create the optimum balance in the universe and in our world and our society, we need to allow that balance to self-organize because nobody can plan that balance. They do what Omar said. They take a little piece and they, they, make, they look at it and they make assumptions and they make laws around it. And all it does is create more problems. Whereas people can solve their own problems and with the technology that we have today, we can create circles of trust within families, within communities, and across the world. And those, spirit, those communities aren't just limited to geography, they are expanded into all sorts of other areas. And Alex Nikoloff and I, who, who co-authored this paper, but we, we don't claim, if you like, proprietary ownership. We didn't create this paper. It, it emerged out of the critical thinking process. But what we're, what we're also exploring alongside the decentralization of money is the decentralization of data. Uh, and I'm not going to outstay my welcome anymore by, by going into that in any great depth. Although I would recommend you to look at an open sense map project, which is a distributed weather station system dotted around the globe. And by decentralizing data, we don't need 5G, which damages our health and increases surveillance. There are many other technologies which can achieve exactly the same effect. So we can decentralize money, we can decentralize data, and we can re return to our natural state of co-creative development as human beings. And with all the foundations that we have in place, a, a world of miraculous abundance is more than possible it could already be underway, <clears throat> in spite of how dark it looks at the moment. You done, Clive? So, Bismillah, uh, I want to end with trying something new, and that is to add some spirituality to our discussions, because it's not just about knowing the enemy and, and anger and rage at the enemy, it's also about really understanding uh, and accepting the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the difficult getting ready and having stability to deal with the days that are ahead of us. So if we're not, you know, spiritually grounded, then all of this is just, uh, this knowing will just be against us on the day of judgment. So I want to start with the very first thing, okay, which is, I want to start a type of remembrance of Allah that has to do with the Quran and one that includes uh, different forms of, you can say, reinforcement that counters what I was talking about before about the media coming up into us and getting us to do things in a robotic way. When I was talking about uh, the people driving one car but then coming out and praying in a certain way. Okay, So let's start with the very beginning. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim Okay, I want you to imagine, okay, visualize, that you are seeking and begging and broken and you are being like stabbed by these devils from right, left and center, right? And you are calling out on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this time uh, that Allah, you protect me, you give me shelter and I do kufr, I do, I seek your refuge, I take your help away from all of these shouting. Now, somebody might say, what is the proof of that in the Quran and the Sunnah? I will give it to you. One day, the Prophet ﷺ was sitting and he was pushing something, pushing something away from him. And there's more than one version of this narration. Now, Abu Bakr saw that 
and asked the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet said that Shaytan was bringing me this image and I was pushing it away. Okay? And so, uh, I want, this is called visualization. Okay? And it is very, very effective uh, in terms of bringing, rooting something into your heart. Okay? So now, uh, let's uh, do this, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let's do this for about, uh, so now imagine this. Okay? And just say, A'udhu Billah, you are begging Allah to protect you from Shaytan of Rajim. Okay? And so, A'udhu Billah min Shaytan of Rajim. A'udhu Billah min Shaytan of Rajim. A'udhu Billah min Shaytan of Rajim. If you remember, uh, the mother of Maryam, A'udhuha wa Billiyatha min Shaytan of Rajim. She prayed to Allah, protection from Shaytan, right? And all of its forces. And for its, for the children. So now, when the Prophet ﷺ gathered Hassan and Hussein, he would ask Allah for protection for them. Uh, uh, you know, Allah would do isti'az for them. Uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ would do isti'az on Hassan and Hussein. Uriduhuma, I seek refuge for both of them, the Prophet would say ﷺ. So now, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan al-rajim, knowing that you're attacked by your enemy, left, right, and center, and you are absolutely helpless without the power of Allah, without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan al-rajim, 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 and for all of us, na'udhu billah, I, we all seek protection for each other because we all depend upon one another. We all need guidance. My guidance is dependent upon the level of your guidance. And my protection is dependent upon your level of protection. So we all need to pray for each other. This is why in Fatiha it's in the plural. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nista'in. And that's why you say, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeema sirat al-ladina namta alihim. Guide us to the path you have blessed. So, A'udhu Billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim 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 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم 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 نعوذ 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 بالله من الشيطان الرجيم اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه I'm done well okay um, Matt, I don't know where you, where you are about the uh, the auditorium um first make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.